Welcome to Grow For It. It's a podcast for small business owners, managers, and professionals. The goal is to give me a chance to work with the space between your ears, you know, on your mindset, to help you focus on the things that really matter to your success. I want to enable you to concentrate on pursuing your vision, setting meaningful goals, and engaging in the day-to-day activities that will have the biggest impact. Thanks for joining me. Well, friends, welcome back. This is episode 28, and I'm very, very pleased to have Michael G. Hall of Hall & Associates Incorporated. He's an executive advisor, and we're going to talk about human analytics. The topic itself is pretty cool. Um, I'll give you some of my personal experience of of having uh, worked with Mike uh, here recently, but I want to unpack this and give him a chance to kind of talk about what he does with businesses, why what he provides businesses, the insights and the information are so important and so valuable to what they do. Uh, that quite honestly, let's just jump in. Mike, welcome to the studio, guy. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Glad to have you here. So, I, you know, in, in looking at we, the first time we met, we met through a mutual acquaintance named Coral Abood. She's more of a, a marketing and branding uh, consultant. And uh, Coral's actually been on the podcast before, and she she kind of connected us up. And you introduced yourself as saying, hey, you know what? Um, I'm in human analytics. And I thought that was one of the coolest job titles that I've heard <laughs> in a long time. Do, unpack that for us. What, what actually is that? You know, um, the best definition I've heard of it is Google it. And it says <laughs> it's the systematic identification and quantification of the human drivers of business outcomes. So, so what does that mean? What does that mean? So have you seen the movie Moneyball? Oh, yeah. Okay. We do Moneyball for companies. That we is play so cool. Moneyball with humans. The same way that you do in the athletics, they're using athletic analytics. You know, the NFL scouting combine was just now going on. They measure everything. You have several things and attributes you can measure that are job-related attributes. You can use analytics to measure them and place the right people in the right places. And I guess that's the, that's the core part of this, really, is making sure you've got the right people on the bus, got them in the right seats, right? Just like Jim Collins said. Just Absolutely. like Jim Collins. In fact, yeah. when you and I initially spoke, and I went through my assessment with you, uh, you kind of teed it up that way, and, and that made a lot of sense. Friends, if you haven't seen Moneyball, uh, here's the premise. It, it's a movie about a baseball team, and normally the scouts get together and they say, well, you know, this guy does this, this guy does this. Yeah, he'll, he'll, be, a, he'll be a good home run hitter. This guy will be a great pitcher because of this. It's just things I'm observing because I've got all this talent and experience. What was different about the movie Moneyball is they brought in somebody who said, well, let's just look at the data. Let's look at the hard stats. And he kind of turned all of those premises on their ears and, it, and they really put together a high-performing team based on the data. And that's what's different about this. This is why I guess we refer to this as money ball for companies. But it mm-hmm. really comes down to, again, human analytics. Analytics, I mean, anybody that's working on the online right now, we're always looking at our metrics. You know, how many visitors, what's this go? What's this doing, what's that doing? But the data doesn't lie. It doesn't. Um, it, it is amazing what you can find out about people. You know, one of, the, one of the things I ask people when they say, well, Mike, how would I apply this in my company? One of the things I ask people, I say, if you could or had to or could, fire your entire workforce or just maybe your leadership team how many of them would you enthusiastically hire back tomorrow and if the answer is not 90 95 percent then you can use analytics to help unbelievable and i guess it really comes down to some people are in positions because they just they you know they've been promoted up through the ranks they do have some experience but sometimes we're just not necessarily wired for that particular role and I could, exactly. I could see that where things kind of get sideways. I mean, we've all heard of the Peter principle where you get promoted up to a certain point to where you're just kind of out of your element yeah. and you don't really excel, you don't really perform the way you have in the past because this role is not necessarily suited or maybe you're just not suited for that particular role. It's, it, it's notoriously happening in sales fields in particular. You know, you take your best salesperson and make them a manager, and more often than not, those people that were your great hunters, let's say, yeah, absolutely. are not great managers. Not great cultivators of, of internal of, of talent. talent. Yeah. They, they can go out and sell all day. But to your point of being able to motivate and communicate people, build cohesive teams, stri- throw in some strategy, have some vision, they may not carry those elements that you need to be That's a, a different skill set altogether. Absolutely. Definitely. I mean, I've spent 20, 22 years in sales, sales management roles for some pretty big companies. And yeah, I, we saw that a lot. We saw they would bring in salespeople, coach them up, and, and they would do really well excel into a managerial position and maybe go back into marketing or something like that. But again, that, even though they have the knowledge, doesn't necessarily 
lend itself to that new role. Some people are just better cut out for certain roles, and they can maximize value, income, job satisfaction, engagement, Absolutely. all of those things. Absolutely. Um, you know, you bring up engagement. I read a, a recent Gallup release talk about engagement has dropped. Employee engagement has dropped for the third straight year, even lower than it was in COVID. Right wow. now in the United States, employee engagement's about at 32%. Uh, the workforce is engaged. And engaged means you like your boss, you like your job, and you have an emotional attachment to what you're doing. When I was in corporate, that was a big trend. People started really asking that question about engagement. And I'll be honest with you, we, out in the field, we didn't really have all of the background to the nuances of what does that question really mean? I mean, do you feel engaged? Um Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I've got calls to make today. Um, yeah. I, I didn't really understand what that is, but for a company having an engaged workforce, having an engaged sales team, whatever, that's everything. It's absolutely. Gallup went on in that same study to point out that the average U.S. company uses loses thirty four hundred dollars per ten thousand in salary that they pay to disengagement in the employee workforce. Back again, if you're if you're not tuned in and turned on and in the right position, let's go back to the baseball analytics analogy, is if I'm a right-handed pitcher and you're asking me to throw the ball left-handed, how engaged am I going to be? All I'm going to be is frustrated. Exactly. You know, because I, I'm probably not going to get the ball over the plate, and if I do, people are going to be parking it on me. Right. So you put the right people in the right place with the right skill sets, just like the NFL scouting combine analogy we drew. That's the second question I typically ask people is, do you know for sure, do you have the right people on the bus? Did you get the wrong people off the bus? And do you have the right people in the right seats? If you don't know that, I can tell you with analytics. And that really, let, let me kind of walk through, I guess we'll, we can walk the audience through my assessment. That's something I, I can share with some people. Sure. Um, we got together and it really was about two different questions. Mm -hmm. And it had a whole bunch of different options, and I just made some selections. But I guess it was the way the questions were asked, and based on what I actually responded with, the, the selections that I made, or and it was kind of like, okay, choose all that apply type thing. I was astounded, Mike, to be honest with you. I was astounded at how accurate, because some of these things I, I knew about myself. Sure. But you were able to draw some inferences and connections that I really hadn't talked to people about or really hadn't known, I, I guess, in the context that you described it. And, and I thought, wow, what a valuable tool. You, you, you don't have to necessarily talk about my stuff, but do, I mean, you want to talk about how that assessment and why that works that way? Yeah, the, well, why it works that way is the secret sauce <laughs> <laughs> of the analytics. We'll give you Mike's uh, phone number and website here in a little bit. <laughs> but, um, you know, the ability to tell if somebody is simply, uh, in, in your case, is, you know, are you a deductive analytic problem solver or an intuitive inductive problem solver? Those people both can problem solve. They just do it different ways. And the expectation of the way that the problem is to be solved could be unfairly burdened on somebody. Well, and, that, and that's also deals with the dynamic of the people around them and the type of organization you yeah. have. Maybe certain types of getting to the answer is more important because, again, Com organizations are complex. Organizations are multi-layered, and sometimes it, it, there has to be communication at different areas of the, of the decision-making process, but also within different stakeholders. And Absolutely. if they're not connecting, if they're not working cohesively together, you got a you got a train wreck, or you got a suboptimal uh, result in either. Absolutely, way. and sometimes a great example I can talk about is a client that. Um, they had two sales managers, and with your background in sales, yep. you'll appreciate this. And about half of the sales team themselves were performing, and about half weren't. And um, what we did is we kind of looked at them, and we looked at the people that were performing well under manager A, and we said, well, manager A is a deductive analytic leader. And all the people that are performing well underneath him are deductive analytics. The intuitives aren't doing as well. However... The intuitive salespeople are doing very well under an intuitive leader because they know how to teach each other what it's to do. Matching the talent and the people with the right leadership, the right leadership. and the right leadership skills. We literally just took the inductives and put all the inductives on one team and all the deductives on one team, and sales went up 20%. Unbelievable. Just by playing human chess with the data is these people 
they were in the right seats. They were all really good salespeople for the most part. But where they were is they were under the wrong leader. That makes sense. S still trying to sell the same type of product, still trying to do the same yeah. stuff. But again, it, it's the methodology yeah. and it's the support systems and the communication systems that I'm sorry, for a sales guy, sometimes that can wreck your day. You yeah. know, because um, we take things sometimes very sensitively and other times we, we've got thick skin, but it depends on how it, how it rests because we're going to think about that criticism or that, that coaching advice all day long. You well, know? And that's something else with the analytics that we get into is you, you very much focus on the other individual. I, I like to, w one of the reasons I got into this, if not the reason, is I heard of the platinum rule. You know, everybody knows the golden rule. T treat others as, as you want to be treated. The problem is there's literally like a 95% probability that if I treat you the way I want to be treated, I'm mistreating you. So I'm aspiring to the platinum rule, and that's treat others as they want to be treated. It's a subtle difference, but it's a huge difference. It's, it's, it is a big difference. And if I'm doing that, and this comes back to employee engagement, if you're treating others the way they want to be treated, and that means about, it's not not holding people accountable. This is the antithesis of that. It's absolutely holding people accountable, but it's doing it in such a fashion and communicating and motivating them in such a fashion that they are willingly held accountable wow. to what they do. And they want to be measured by that. They enjoy and they will actually excel in that scenario, in that environment. Exactly. There, there are some people that are great salespeople, but believe it or not, they don't want, they don't like that salesperson of the year award to be paraded up front because they're more introspected than things than, than, than that would allow someone to be. Where I would be up there personally pounding my chest saying, yeah, I won, I won, I won. Other people aren't like that. So it's knowing something as simple as, do I give the best sales guy I've got, do I quietly give him the plaque that says he's number one, or do I parade him on stage and do that? It, dep it depends on the scenario. It depends. It depends on the person. Yeah. And, and if you individualize your communication and motivation to the people based on the data analytics, more often than not, you get positive results. You get the right people in the right seat, properly motivated and properly communicated with. It just, it just struck me. Any parent that has two or more kids does this. They do this naturally. It's I okay, to. I can't talk to Johnny the same way I talk to Susie, and I can't talk to Susie the same way I talk to Johnny. They motivate different. They feel different. They, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to inspire Johnny and, and maybe shut down Susie inadvertently because th I'm just trying to treat them all the same. I have good intentions, but again, it's not received that way. And as you said, the platinum rule, as they would like to be spoken to or coached or, or, or dealt with. Yeah. That, that, that makes perfect sense when I look at it through that, that parenting lens. But so, sometimes we leave that uh, at home when we leave for the office. We do. Um, Mike, let me ask you this. What is your background? How did you get into this niche? This, it's a fascinating niche. And I'm just thinking of all the things you could have done when you grew up. I mean, how did you get here? How did I get here? Well, I, uh, I spent the first 20 years of my life in corporate America and um, had, had reasonable success there, had, had a couple... Had a couple failures there, and I couldn't figure out in in corporate America. It's like, well, why why am I why did I do such a great job literally at one place and at another? Why am I struggling? And I couldn't figure that out. It's like, and it just came back to well, the one commonality here is me, so I must be broken. So then I then I went in and said, gosh, well, if I'm broken in corporate America, which I I thought I was at the time, is I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur anyway. So I spent 20 years being a serial entrepreneur and similar results. I uh, had, had some positive liquidity events and had a couple that, of those ideas that didn't go so well. And a, one right as we were coming about a positive liquidity event of a company we had here locally, um, I, was, I was approached to say, have you heard about human analytics? And I took the same assessment you did. And... I was, for the first time in my life, I was like, I'm not broken. Wow, th this is really, really cool. It was that, it was a conflux or concurrence in events of that and, and a very um, 
humbling story, if you don't mind me sharing. No, it. go ahead, please. Um, I was in an airport. I was I flew around a lot. Yeah. did a lot of yeah. consulting and stuff. Because I mean, you've got a background in healthcare and fintech, uh, data. You, I mean, yeah. you, you've, you've had a number of significant roles, actually. Yeah, yeah. C level, um, C level roles. C level roles, and you know, and, and that's, and you know, I've been in the C suite for about 20, 25 years yeah. in one form or another. So yeah, I've, I've, I've really been blessed in my exposure to that stuff. Um, and one of the more eye-opening moments in that was, um, I was, you know, how flights get delayed, right? Sure. And then I, it was a Wednesday, and I happened to be getting a, you know, a connection through DFW, and uh, it was two a.m. because wow. the, the pilots kept timing out. You know, it, when am I ever going to get where I'm going? All this stuff, and I, you know, and, um, and this was back when we all still wore suits and and, yep. and yep. things like I remember this. Remember that well. Um, you know, so I was in, you know, I was coated up and had my tie on and my, you know, my, my dress shoes and all that. And I thought, well, I'll at least go over here and get my shoe shined, you know, and I'm grumbling and I, <clears throat> and I, I'm just complaining to this guy that's shining my shoes. I mean, man, life is using words I shouldn't have used, sure. things of like that. And then this had to be 80, 85 year old man with arthritic hands looked up at me and said, sir, it beats the alternative. Wow. And I went, oh, my God, how can I be this self-centered? And I looked down and said, it's Wednesday. It's 2 a.m. And this guy's 80 or 85 years old, and he has arthritis in his hand. And he's shining my shoes, and I'm the one complaining. And I went, it was at that point I knew I needed to get off out of my own head. That's it's not moment. about me. It's about others. The analytics came along and gave me a tool, but... By nature, I'm very self-absorbed. I am very self-absorbed. Well, this gives me a tool to be the person I actually aspire to be. And that's the biggest reason I'm in this. And this this is a, a bit of a roadmap. I mean, this really lays out, hey, I know how I operate and I know where I thrive and, and why I thrive. Mm -hmm. and exactly. When you, can, when you have that self-awareness now, you know the opportunities to plug into and you know when you're at a stress level because again, it's that it's that mindfulness. It's that hey, I know how I'm wired, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're all wired, wired. some way, right? Uh, and and you can't do much about that. You can learn to deal with it, but you're wired a certain way, right? And, and I love this that that this allows C-suite executives to have better insights into the people whom they're leading, so that they in fact can be better leaders. Exactly, and that's the third question I ask people typically: is how well do you really know yourself? And it's one thing to have other people's perception, non-analytic data-based perceptions of you and the world's perceptions of you and your perceptions of yourself. And then to have math and science and psychometric data say, this is who you are. Then what you can do is you can truly look at it from, a, from more of a humble standpoint and go, here are my strengths. Here are my areas I need to work yeah, on yeah. that I need to be aware of. Because we're really, we are who we are. The old adage, no matter where you go, there I am. <laughs> it happens. So what, but what I find a lot, especially with leaders I work with, leadership that I work with, is when you have the objective data, it gives me power to speak to power and to say, you know, you're, you might be, in this case, hypothetically, a very emotional person. And the emotions might get the best of you. And that combination with any myriad of other variables that we look at is going to be your challenge to control as a leader. So when you feel yourself reacting instead of thinking, no, that's just how you're wired. Take a breath. And sip before you react, yeah. sip of water. Walk, walk away if you need to. But re-engage when you're ready. And I have had that one piece of advice. I've had that help more people than I know. And, and it, it helps them embrace, again, it's embracing who you are. Not, like I said, I wasn't broken. Right, right. It, it's not being ashamed of it. It's, well, this is how I'm probably going to react in a high-stress situation. Yeah. Know that in advance and deal with it proactively. Exactly. Instead of dealing with the damage you caused later. And you you walk back into the room. And you're like, oh, what what what's wrong with everybody? Exactly. Well, There's dead was bodies me. everywhere. Yeah, it yeah. was me. It was yeah. me right? so, yeah. What I did, what did I do? Yeah. Well, and, um, so yeah. Now, 
early on, you know, you talked about, you know, this was great for sales teams and things like that. But this this tool, this this, this process is not just geared for sales teams, right? No, it, it's just one of the easiest ways to convey the valid, the validity or the or the the usefulness of it yeah, is, yeah. hey, how's your sales team performing? If you've got the 80-20 rule of 20% of your team's per, you know, doing 80% of your dollars, what happens if we could literally replicate your top performers across the board? How much is that worth to you? And people typically can quantify their sales numbers pretty quick. Well, yeah. my top sales producer does $2 million a year. Exactly. Well, you've got two of those. What if you had 10 of them? Oh, Game my game. gosh. That, that, game changer. Yeah, it's $16 million to me, in, in my case, maybe. Yeah. And you go, well, okay, so do you want to have a conversation? But the other thing That's a nice first pitch. <laughs> <laughs> it, it makes, yeah, it's, you know, sales is, is one of the more obvious yeah. places. Yeah. But, um, you know, clients in, all, in every industry known to man, you know, across, across the country and across the world, um, you, you can find what makes a great project manager on construction, and that's not a, you know, that's just about productivity. But think about that. You got a guy running a 40, 50, $100 million, <coughs> excuse me, construction site. Right. And if he's, if he's not a little visionary, a little forward thinking, he's probably going to do things and create issues that he doesn't even know he or she is creating long before they occur. So you need people that have a little foresight. Well, that's something you can actually measure. That's a, and you and I went through that in my assessment. We, we kind of sat down and said, Jim, you tend to think this way. And I was so surprised that you were able to draw those inferences from just some simple selections I made yeah. on, on a, on a two-question survey. Yeah, we can tell, um, do you, are, you, are you more future-oriented in your right, thought? Right. Are you present-day in your thought? Are you, or are you more historically focused? Or are you present and historically focused? How do you, you know, I think in the present and I look to the past for answers. And this is what that means. This is how that will manifest. This yes. is how it will affect you. This is how it will affect those around you. Yeah. And ultimately, whatever role that, yeah. that you're and, taking. And on. then what you do is you comply these same analytics to positions. So you say, gosh, I want, and let's just say a bookkeeper. I was a CPA for 20 years. Sure. So is I'm going to get a bookkeeper. So what you do is you apply the analytics to a hypothetical position, and the analytics tell you, in essence, the attributes you're looking for, who you're looking for. Then what you can do is we can take the same kind of assessment that you took and overlay that against the quote-unquote prototype right? and say, yeah, gosh, this person is a great match, has a great opportunity to best fulfill the needs of what this position requires. And it's so much better than a subjective evaluation where you're thinking, I, it seems like this guy would work or this girl would work. It seems like this would, this person would be a good fit. And there's room for that. But there I, is but, room. I, but I think where you bring the data to say, okay, well, realistically, we have to factor this in. Because you may lie about the numbers, but the numbers don't lie. Right. And, and I, I've always looked at that. The data is the data. You don't have to like it. But most of the time, it's pretty accurate. Well, if you to your point, I'll take off a little deeper on your point here. Is you know, let's call a resume what it is. Sure. It's an obituary. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's what it is. It's everything I ever did right, and nothing I ever did wrong. It's glorified, and I've put it in this pretty paper and pretty fonts, and you know, put it out, and now I'm doing video resumes. But they're obituaries. And so, what are the things that you're really looking at? You know, you've been in the positions. Yep, yep. When you're hiring somebody, what are you doing? You're, you're looking at an obituary. It, if I can't find three people out of six billion on the face of the planet to give me a good reference, something's wrong. You're right. Um, you, it really comes down at the end of the day, more often than not, to gut. Did I like the person? Well, there's lots of likable people that are incompetent in certain positions. That was my biggest challenge as a hiring manager because I was a sales guy. I was ultimately, for, for many years, a sales guy. I got along by def I got along with everybody because that was in my best interest. Yep. And it just, I, I'm wired that way. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty easy going in, sure. in that regard. So I made bad hires because I got along with the person sitting across the desk from me. Yeah, you like Yeah, they, they fit in great here. They, yeah. they could do this. Yeah, they've got the resume. That I, wasn't, I had so many blind spots because I didn't have the data behind it to say, wait a minute, let's check this up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, th this person... Though I like them, they aren't going to be a hunter for me. They're going to be a farmer. 
or they're, gosh, they're just not a salesperson. They may be the greatest bookkeeper or project manager in the world, but what they're not is a salesperson. Right. And it's hard to push them into that role and expect yeah. them to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that's something else that I like to play around with. Yeah. Well, Mike, let's talk about this. Describe for us the typical type of client who picks up the phone and goes, hey, Mike Hall, can we talk? Mm-hmm. Who, who is that person and what is the engagement like when, when you step in with a company and you partner up with a company? Walk us through, what, what does that feel like for them? What's the user experience? The user experience is very much starts the way it started with you, is, is one person. So everybody has to know Coral. Everybody's got to know Coral, exactly. <laughs> and, and everybody does know Coral. Yeah, She's so. great at what she does. I think so. Um, it, it more often than not does start on, hey, I've done this thing and it's pretty cool. And like you said, I'm borrowing your words, is it, you were impressed as to the validity yeah. of the data. It's like, oh my gosh, how could you possibly know this about me? You know, a little, I, little unnerving. Yeah, it, it can be. <laughs> it can be. Um, and, and so it's people inherently see the value of what if you could know that on the front end about everybody? Now it's not unnerving. Now it's a very powerful tool. And so that is one of the ways to go about this is what if you could back to my first question, what if you fired everybody in your company today? How many of them would you enthusiastically hire back tomorrow? And if it's not 90 or 95 percent, then we've got a quite, we've got a conversation we can have because I can tell you what these people are about, who they are, not only what they're doing, but who they are and why. And, you know, the human condition is such, I forgot who said it, it as one, some philosopher, but the, the human condition is such that if you know why, you can deal with any what. We get into the why and the how. And you do that with analytics. And do you help them scope out, okay, for this particular role, these are the attributes or the characteristics, yes. or do they already have that? Does HR already have that for you? Or? No, we. that's very much, thank you for, yeah, for bringing yeah. me back to task. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> is, um, Done this a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> is, yes, we work very much hand in hand on, okay, let's talk about what this position may require, and let's use the analytics to define the position, but let's start basically with what you have. Let's start with your job description, and then let's get everybody, let's get somebody maybe that's a rock star in the position currently, somebody that's maybe a peer of that, of somebody in the position, somebody, the supervisor, and the supervisor's supervisor. Let's get four or five people to do these analytic assessments relative to what they know about the job. And then the analytics will say, oh, this is the ideal person you're looking for. And it maybe it's as, maybe as simple as, I want to replicate that person over there because there are those two those two take an assessment, and they're the same basic profile. And you say, oh, that's what I'm looking for. We want more people like that. That's interesting. So th- then you can go through and help administer those, or are you mm-hmm. – okay. So yes. I mean, you stay with you stay with the company for a while, right? Yeah, I, mean, I stay with the company. It, it's not just, a, it's not just a, a program that you – utilized based on software platform. It is very much with me as an executive advisor on an ongoing basis, utilizing the tool. Now, the more, the more senior you become in the clients, clients that have had two and three years, utilize me less because they're more self-sufficient, but very much there on an ongoing basis to help with um, the job scoping, the matching, <clears throat> excuse me, the... Um, the, the training, you you, the, you know, you got to train the trainers on yeah. this stuff. Yeah. You, you, you have to get leadership and you can't just, you can't just say, here's, here's a report. Now go figure it out. You have to teach them how to use the tool. And so we spend a number of days working together in workshop formats to do the tool. Well, I, th- to I thought it was kind of interesting tool. because yeah, we, we had the, the answers that I selected Mm-hmm. But then, okay, so this is what this means, and here are the here are the interactions and the in the relationships between how you answered this and that, and the fact that you chose this and this over here kind of indicates that. And I thought, wow, I mean, the fact that one, you know that stuff, obviously, but two, that you can draw those inferences um, where I may look at it different because I don't have the training behind it, right? I can say, right. okay, yeah, okay, so that's my label, or that's okay, I'm I'm like this. But here's what that means, Jim, and, and here's how you can utilize that. Right. And, and these are the things that you need to be aware of on the flip side. 
Yeah, on um, an ongoing basis, that's exactly what what we do. It the you know ten percent, ten maybe twenty percent in some smaller companies of what we do is on the hiring side, yeah. and eighty to ninety percent of what I do is on the ongoing management and leadership and running the company to optimize engagement and productivity. And at the end of the day, that's what all this is about: is talent optimization. That's again, we're back to human analytics, talent, yes, we are. talent optimization. Yeah. Mike, the the scope and scale of these types of companies. I mean, these aren't small, you know, one or two person shops. I mean, you you deal with more established, lar- larger scope, larger scale companies. I would think we, you know, you'd be surprised um, at the size of companies that we can help. Um, I've I've got clients that um, are without revealing too much yeah, are, yeah, are, are yeah, not are, are are not big. Um, you know, where we're really effective, of course, the bigger the company, you know, there's some more opportunities, but a lot of times you get into some, some, you, you get into, you get into the politics of things, sure, thick, the sure. thick of thin things then. Um, but companies, you know, with 50 to 500 employees is, is kind of a, a real sweet spot. That, that, that's a, that's a sweet spot for you. It's, yeah. And it really industry, it's, it's really industry agnostic. It, absolutely. Industry agnostic because we're talking about people. Interesting. Interesting. Talking about people and people are people, no matter where we go, there we are. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. So you're going to, you potentially could be associated with this, with this company that, that partners with you for up to maybe three years or so. I mean, it depends on the, on the level of, of what they're looking at. Five, and ten years. Um, that's, yeah. that's awesome. And yeah. so they kind of bring you in as a resource from time to time and just kind of keep, I guess once you get the benchmark and once you get things going, then you're just kind of making sure everything's rolling optimally. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it, minimal monthly check-ins and yeah, things like yeah. that. But uh, So it's not a heavy free. lift for the, C, for the C-suite. Um, once you once you're kind of in and engaged, once once we're engaged, there, there's a heavy lift on the front end for you know the first month. Right, right. First month is is a little heavy lift, and then but again, it, it begins to pay instant dividends. Um, just you know the the latest statistics are, and I'm sure you've seen these. Is you know uh, what is a what does a bad hire cost you? I was I was thinking of the exact same thing. The cost of a bad hire is, is it, so it, so much more expensive. It, it's than people you know it, it's minimal to two x your annual yeah. salary burden, and if it's customer facing, it's eight to ten x. Yeah, you know the annual salary. You know, and that brings me to another question I ask individuals and and people that are looking for help is like, how high's your turnover? You know, in the United States right now, turnover is forty seven to fifty five percent, depending on which which baseline you want to use that's a hundred million people that are going to leave their current positions in the next 12 months well what's your turnover and the cost of turnover is is catastrophic can be and especially when you lose a key contributor key player well with the analytics you can foresee and prevent that type of turnover. Well, I thought the predictive nature of this was was kind of fascinating. As we talked in, in preparation for this episode, you talked about I, I can I can find within the organization people that are probably on the edge, even though you have no clue that they're that they're even thinking about exiting. And suddenly, I get a call three months later, and they say, "Hey, so and so just left." I'm like, "Yeah, I, I kind of knew that." Yeah, we we, we told you that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so again, you get the, the analytics help to indicate that. Yeah, it really does. You can you can tell if people are engaged. Uh, disengaged, stressed, um, and sometimes you know people are some one of those things, and it has nothing to do with work. It could it could be something that, you know personal, but if you're a true, at least in my mind, if you're a true leader, you're going to care about your employees. You have to, and the fact of the matter is, is you know nobody wants nor is supposed to bring the home life into the office. But if you have a terminal illness or someone in your family is terminally ill or you're, you, you lose a sibling or a parent you know, or someone's in the sandwich generation and is having, having it tug at them from both ends, those things wear. And maybe a little awareness and sensitivity to those things is a good thing. Well, I, I think that, that individual remembers that when you, when you executed well in that regard, you showed some empathy or maybe you, yeah. you, you shared a cup of coffee and said, Hey, I've, I've kind of been down this road before too. And yeah. how you doing those types of interactions do wonders for engagement because it's yeah. like, wow, they, they, you actually cared. Um, I was going through a, a pretty tough situation in a sales role 
and my boss's boss called me while I was driving. I forget where I was, but he said, I want you to pull over the car. I'm like, okay. And he goes, hey, I hear things have been a little tough. You mind talking to me? And we spent probably 20 minutes. I'm stuck in a, in a cornfield somewhere off, off of a highway talking to my boss's boss on a cell phone, and it was one of the most genuine, personal conversations that I'd had in a long time. And the fact that I knew he took his time, because I, I knew what his, quote, rank was, what his role right. was in the company, and the right. fact that he picked up the phone call, picked up the phone and called me, you know, and, and spent 20 minutes with me, it meant everything. I mean, I won't say it fixed the situation, but it allowed me to know that people in that organization actually did care. Yeah. Uh, that was William Ballard. I, I still remember that call out of uh, Mississippi. And uh, just just a, a phenomenal guy. And that moment, to this day, I still well up a little bit uh, because I remember what was going on. And the fact that William Ballard called me on that day yeah. and spent 20 minutes saying, hey, I kind of understand this. And empathize, didn't just sympathize, empathize, shared some stuff in uh, right. his life. And oh my gosh. I mean, you're talking about a kind of a re-energization. Um, it felt good, and and I did feel engaged. If, if that's the, the right yeah, word to use, I yeah, mean, I, I feel mean, like wow, somebody you, you somebody have cares. the emotional. You you think you like your boss. Yeah, you're connected with them, and yeah. you believe they care. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. that you know, would you have run through a wall for that man? Uh, on that day, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Well, Mike, as we kind of close out the episode, let me ask you this. If I'm sitting there and I've got a leadership role in an organization, how do I really know it's time to pick up the phone and engage with you to, to have a conversation or to maybe let's talk about this? I mean, are, are there some things that typically if I'm seeing these patterns or if I'm seeing these issues, I'm, I might want to engage with my call? You know, it really it, it it comes back to a lot of those questions I've asked earlier is if you really wouldn't hire back 95 yeah. percent of your people. Yeah. 90, 95% of your people, that's one. Do you really know yourself? Do you know how to play human chess using analytics? Is your turnover rate what it should be? Or what it, could it be better than what you, you know, where it is now? Are your sales numbers where they need to be? Are you growing the way you want to grow? Are you thinking about if I'm a family business, are you thinking about turning, turning the business over to heirs? that might not want to be in the business. I've, I've dealt with that issue very personally yeah. with, with some people is, you know, the individual you're looking to put in this, take your, take this, the head of this from you is, is not that you're going to have to rethink the way you do this. Right. This isn't going to work well. You know, when you have the data, you can, you can, you can be, um, I, I don't believe in brutal honesty. I think brutal honesty is just brutal. But you, you can be radically candid. Yeah, yeah. Because it's data by, backed by data and facts. But those are the questions. You know, are, your, are you hitting your goals? That's a simple question. If you're not hitting your, your top and bottom line goals, <clears throat> odds are you got a people problem. Because at the end of the day, we're all people. Let's, let's talk about what it is. That makes perfect. And, and, and this is an opportunity for them at least to engage with you. Yeah. Now, now Mike, you, you've got a new website that's uh, coming up online. It's MikeGHall.com. I know that's out there. Yes, uh, you're based here in Louisville, right? What's, your, what's your phone number here lo locally? Uh, 502-303-2164. In, obviously, you're on LinkedIn and, and other mm -hmm. places as well, so people can check you out there as well. Um, now, you're based in Kentucky, but... Are you geographically bound, or do you do you still travel? I still travel. I'm I'm head. I'm hopping on a plane next week, as a matter of fact. And uh, my uh, quite a few of my my clients are not within this area. Um, I I would like to focus more. You know, being in Louisville, I'd like to focus on you know Louisville and Kentucky, Southern Indiana. It's just easier. It is just easier. But the reality of the matter is, is I have clients that refer me as, "Hey, I'm in a I'm in a peer group that meets in I'm making this up, Denver, Colorado, right. and there's a company out there that wants to talk to you, and they wind up being a client." You know that that's very common. Referrals are very common, but it's funny. There's a lot of those referrals are outside of the state, so that's well, that's, that that's yeah. how I get outside the state. Yeah. I I try to focus where I'm where I am on you know here in Southern Indiana, but uh, referrals take me outside the state quite a bit. Outstanding. So once again, if if you want to pick up the phone and you say you know I, I think uh, I think Mike and I need to have a call, 
Uh, you can reach them at 502-303-2164, the website, mikeghall.com. And, uh, Mike, I want to thank you for your time. I mean, this, is just, this has just been fascinating. I mean, I, I have the benefit that the listeners don't have yet is that I've actually been through the assessment. I've actually sat down with you afterwards, and we talked about it. And just the insights uh, I thought were just literally amazing. Um, and, thank you. And I, I, posted, I posted that out on LinkedIn and Facebook uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was excited to get you into the studio today and say, thank hey, you. let's talk about what you do yeah. and, and how you can help others. Uh, friends, I hope you found this informative. One of the things that I've always said is, you know, it's about, you know, helping – work with your mindset. And sometimes when things are keeping you up at night, it, it could actually be the, the performance numbers. And I think when, a, when an expert like Mike Hall is in, in town and available to you, it might be one of those phone calls you want to make. And uh, I, I appreciate you sticking to the end here. I hope you will follow up with Mike. I'll have his contact information, by the way, in the show notes. So if you're looking, if you're uh, listening to this podcast and uh, you just want to scroll down, uh, you will have a link to his website and his phone number there again. And as we close out, once again, uh, when you're ready to move your business forward, let's grow for it.